Now that the walls of the pot have been pulled up and roughly shaped, it's time to go through a series of finishing procedures in order for the thrown vessel to be lifted neatly away from the wheel. There isn't only one way to do this, and in this film I'll show you various techniques together with when to utilise certain ones, what works best for me, and all manner of other tips and tricks. For those of you who are just finding this video, this is part 4 in my beginner's guide series, and I've already made 3 previous videos. The first goes over how to centre the clay in great detail, which is followed by one that's focused on opening up the clay and forming the base. And then subsequently to this video was a film dedicated to how to pull up the walls of a pot, which means the tutorial you're about to watch won't discuss any of those topics. Rather it's solely about how I prepare my pots to lift them off the wheel, how I then actually remove them, together with a whole plethora of ideas, tips, and what I think works best. And we'll start where we left off, with a basic cylinder, the walls pulled up nice and evenly, and now ready to be refined, finished, and removed from the wheel. The finishing procedures I go through typically addresses four things, which begins with the rim of the pot, which is one of the most significant parts of any piece you throw on the wheel. As this is a drinking vessel, I don't want it to have a blocky rim, or a rim that's too thick and clunky, as ultimately this portion of the pot is going to be placed into your mouth as you take a sip from the cup. So instead of that blocky square top, I bevel the rim outward so that it comes to a fine point at the apex of the outer wall of the pot, into a finer edge that will fit snugly into the corners of your mouth. I then take a chamois leather and just soften the lip. If you don't have a chamois leather, you can throw it to this fine point and then wet this part of your hand, and then carefully let the clay run through that gap. Next, I use a blunt old trimming tool to remove this skirt of clay from around the base. The tip is rounded so it doesn't scratch the wheel, and in its place you can use practically anything as long as it's got a moderately sharp point. And in terms of the clay that I scraped away, I simply follow the profile of the wall through the flare of clay to the metal of the wheel head. Next, I remove all of the water that's accumulated inside during the throwing process. If you only leave a small bit of slip or a tiny layer of water inside, you'll be able to get away with it. But if you leave thrown pots overnight with a pool of water inside, then that water will likely disintegrate the base of the pot. So it's always good practice to remove as much water and slip as you possibly can. The next step is to clean off the outer walls of the pot, and for the way I lift pots off the wheel, this is arguably the most important step, as it's imperative to remove as much of that sticky slip that covers the outer walls as possible. When I scrape the slip off, I don't push the metal firmly into the clay, instead I rest the metal kidney directly next to the wall, and then I push out against that metal edge from bottom to top, from the inside out. Sometimes I can do this in one pass, and other times it takes a few passes but as long as most of that slip is removed, it should make the process of lifting the pot away from the wheel all that easier. And with a shape like this, it's really easy, as I can just hold the metal in place like a template and a guide and push the clay out against it, which ensures that the walls of the pot are straight, as the tool itself is straight. Not only does removing the slip make the pot itself easier to remove from the wheel, but it also helps your pots dry out more quickly after they've been removed and set aside. Although it isn't quite possible to show this process without the pot spinning, this is roughly what my hand inside is doing when I'm removing the slip. Now, the way I remove most of my pots is just with my bare hands, although it's worth mentioning at this point that this is helped by the fact that the clay I use isn't perfectly smooth and in fact contains some grog. This means it contains some coarse particles, which you can see when I run my fingers through it here. If your clay doesn't have this whatsoever, and it is perfectly smooth, you're going to have a harder time with this technique. But luckily for you, I will go over some methods that work for those types of clay bodies later on in this video. But back to the method at hand, the next step is to remove any slip that's covering your hands. Is if you try and pick the pot off the wheel with hands that are sticky, they'll just stick to the dry surface of the pot, and you'll have a much harder time releasing the vessel onto the wear board without it warping. So, before I lift anything off the wheel, I scrape the slip off my hands against the sharp plastic edge of a bucket that I keep to the left of me. And that's really all it takes, is this removes most of the slip off the areas of my hands that are going to come into contact when they lift the pot away. After I've cleaned my hands, I then take my metal wire, which I then make very taut, and I drag it underneath the pot. The type of wire you use for this process is important. I use this, which is quite as sharp twisted metal wire. 
but quite commonly you'll see wires like this used, which are far more smooth, and when used to slice underneath a pot, sometimes the clay that's left on the wheel and of the pot itself can stick back together again, and it'll stick even worse if you use a nylon wire. A twisted wire makes quite a rough, deep cut, and all the grooves it creates means that the clay is less likely to stick, and in some cases, say if you spin the pot as you're wiring it through, some really quite intricate patterns can be created that sit on the underside of your pots. So, now that the pot has been wired through, the sides of the pot have had the slip scraped off, and with dry hands, it's now time to lift the pot away. So, to do this, I'm using mostly the lower sections of my hands. Those are the areas that are supplying most of the lift, and try as I might, I want to interfere with the upper sections of the walls as little as possible, instead focusing the pressure around the base and the waist of the pot. I clasp my hands around so contact is made. I don't squeeze in too much, I just wait until I can feel that the pot and my hands are touching, and then I lift. And you'll also notice that in that same moment, I spin the wheel. This breaks any tacky seal there might be between the two parts, and helps the vessel lift off cleanly. As I lift the pot away, my two hands stay perfectly level so that the pot doesn't tip to one side too much. So the key here is dry pot and dry hands. Relatively dry, of course, as the pots at this stage are quite soft and if you clasp them too tightly, they will just deform. Here's what happens if you try and lift a pot away with wet hands and a wet pot. And as you can see, as both components are wet and slippery, there's absolutely no way this pot can be removed from the wheel without the walls being heavily distorted and the rim section of the pot warped. To give you a better idea of how the pressure with my hands is allocated around the pot, I thought a cross section would be useful. The reason I lift the pot away from the wheel with the pressure focused around the base is because at the bottom there's the base portion of the pot which prevents the walls from deforming inward as it spans the gap between both sides. Whereas if I was to try and lift from the top, you can see just how much it moves when I apply the same pressure to each part. So I clasp my hands around the base using the sides of my palms and my little fingers to apply most of the lift. The rest of my fingers are clasped around the form gently just to support the form as I lift it away, yet they still do just about make contact. My thumbs, on the other hand, are kept well out of this process, and the last place you really want to touch are those upper sections of the walls. As you move the pot around from the wheel to the wearboard, it's vital that you keep both hands level, as if one hand does lift up higher than the other, there's a good chance the wall can begin to tip inward, which leads to the pot warping in your hands. I think I've mentioned this before too, but in between throwing pots on the wheel, I leave this pad of clay left over from the previous pot. As long as it isn't wet or covered in slip, it really helps the next ball of clay to stick down firmly onto it, like Velcro. If you do remove it and you are throwing on a metal wheel head, make sure you scrape away any excess slip and dry the metal somewhat so that it's just slightly tacky. That way your next lump of clay will stick nicely. So. Let's go over that procedure a second time. I remove the skirt of clay from around the base. Next, I use a sponge on a stick to remove all of the excess water from inside the vessel. Then, I use a kidney of some description, ideally with a sharp edge, to remove the slip from the outside of the pot. I make sure the digits which I'm pushing out with from the inside are wet. That way they don't stick to the inner walls of the pot as they glide up against the sharp edge on the outside. As I do this, I'm very careful not to let the bottom of the kidney skid on the spinning metal wheel head, otherwise it'll jitter and those irregularities will be transferred onto the walls of your pot. I typically use a metal edge, which may be a bit more difficult to control in some circumstances as it really bites into the clay, but at the same time it leaves a very crisp surface. Finally the rim is chamoisied and then I can move on to wiring the pot off the wheel. I hold the handles of this wire with my little fingers and thumbs, and then I use my index fingers to push onto the wire to create a very taut section that can easily be dragged beneath the pot without the worry of the wire bowing upwards as I do so, which we definitely don't want to happen, as that can lead to large chunks of the base of the pot being removed. Next, with dry hands and a dry surface of the pot, I lift the vessel away, focusing a majority of the pressure around the base. As I do so, I spin the wheel in the same instance, which breaks the tacky seal between the two parts, and then the mug can be lifted over to the wear board. It's critical when you lift the pot up 
that the pressure you're applying with each hand is the same. But you can see by doing this how little the pot deforms when I lift it from the base. Whereas if I try to lift it from about halfway up, the rim section instantly begins to deform far more. Because at this level, internally, there's no base of clay that's supporting the walls of the mug. There's nothing to brace them or hold them together. So instead the walls will just bow inwards. And the more you try and lift it off, the more the pot will lose its strength. The walls gradually begin to flop more easily and the rim will warp. So if possible, if you're going to lift it off the wheel, it's best to do it in the first attempt. This brings up another topic, which is the simple fact that the longer you throw one individual pot for, the less strength it has. So if it does take you 10 to 15 minutes to throw one individual pot, then this might not be the technique for you. Of course, it does depend on the complexity of the pot at hand, but with something as simple as a mug, you should really be aiming to throw them in about two to three minutes. And what I mean by all of this is that if you are spending a longer time throwing your pots, they're going to be more saturated with water and therefore inherently they'll be weaker and they'll have less strength, which means they'll be harder to lift off. There is one thing though you can do, which is to place a piece of paper onto the top and then lightly press down around the rim. And then wire the pot off like normal and lift it away like I previously showed. The paper holds the top of the pot in place and in most cases it prevents the rim from distorting. There are of course exceptions. I then place the pot down and very carefully peel away the paper, which can then be set aside and used for the next pot. I occasionally still do this, but it tends to be with very delicately thrown, complex objects. But it shouldn't be a skill you rely on for something like mugs. For the next part of the video, I'll show you some other ways of lifting the pots away from the wheel. This is one I see commonly practiced, which is good for beginners, but it adds an awful lot of time for the creation of each pot. For this method, I make sure the wheel head is clean of any debris, and then I slice underneath the vessel. I then take a handful of water and place it onto the wheel and drag that beneath the pot. And I might do this two or three times to get it really dislodged. I can then hydroplane the mug onto a waiting hand or a throwing bat, and then it can be set aside. The trouble with this method is, with some models of wheels, you have to remove the plastic wheel tray each time you do this, which adds a lot of time for each pot. And equally, the process of setting the pot down can be very precarious, so I much prefer gripping pots from the sides as opposed to the base. So, if you're throwing in production, I don't really recommend this method, as it interrupts your workflow quite a lot. As does this next method, which is using a heat gun, a paint stripper, to dry the outer surface of your thrown pot. I spin the pot and blast the vessel for about a minute or so, and then I wire it through and lift it away. And by doing this, there's literally no distortion when the pot is lifted up. Yet, once again, it probably adds about a minute or two to the creation of each pot, and it isn't something you should learn to rely on. The next method is throwing on bats. This is when, instead of throwing on the metal of the wheel head, you instead throw on these platforms that are raised above. After the pots have been thrown, instead of lifting the pot away itself, you can lift away the pot on the bat, and that way you don't actually touch the freshly thrown and very soft vessel when you lift it away. I have a variety of different sizes of bats for different shapes, and typically I only use them if the pot is wider than it is tall, or if it's a shape that's particularly complex, like the body of one of my angular teapots. But first, in order for the bat to be attached to the wheel, I need to throw a pad of clay onto which the MDF boards can be attached. To make these, I make sure I'm using well-wedged clay and I center it thoroughly, as I don't want this pad of clay to be uneven, as otherwise the throwing bat I attach on top of it will also be uneven. So I center the lump of clay and squash it down, with an aim to create a disc that's about a centimetre thick. How wide this disc is depends of course on the size of bat you're using. I then scrape clean the slip on top, compressing it down and keeping it nice and flat. I also bevel the edge, just for neatness sake, and just give the top one last pass over with my metal kidney, just to scrape away all the slip. Now, if I was to use a bat like this, in this soft state, each time I place a new throwing bat onto this lump, the pad of clay will get slightly lower and lower, which means repetition throwing becomes an issue, especially if I'm using a throwing gauge, as the height of the platform I'm throwing on gradually decreases. So instead, I dry this pad of clay out with a heat gun until it's almost leather hard. And finally, I use the corner of a kidney just to score in a series of concentric grooves. These help the throwing bats to stick firmly against the pad of clay. 
I then wet the back of a bat slightly, just a tiny bit, so it sticks down to this leather hard clay, and then I just continue to throw a pot on top of this platform, as per usual. Sometimes you might notice that your throwing bat goes a little bit off centre, but as long as it's held firmly in place, this really doesn't matter. The only thing you might feel that's a bit different is the positioning of your hands, arms and elbows, as you're now working at a slightly elevated level, which, if you aren't used to it, can feel a bit strange initially, but it doesn't take long to adjust. Bats aren't typically something I use for mugs, unless the shape is exceedingly delicate and finely thrown, or it's angular in such a way that it's difficult to grasp and lift away like I normally would. And by showing you all of these different techniques, I hope to convey that really, which method you use to remove your pot from the wheel is quite situational, and even in my practice, I flitter between all of these. Yet, being able to lift a pot away from the wheel with just your hands, without the need of a throwing bat, or a heat gun, or a piece of paper, is a skill that's worth learning. And finally, I just pry the throwing bat off and lift the pot away with it, which hasn't been deformed whatsoever. I also use bats, mainly, for pots that are wider than they are tall. For pots such as bowls that have very overhanging walls, it would be almost impossible to lift away with just your fingers without deforming the entire pot. Equally, for pots that are quite low and wide, such as bowls like this, or plates for instance, I tend to use very soft clay, as it just makes the centering and pushing down of the lump of clay all the more easy. And this is perhaps another reason why you might be having trouble lifting your pots away from the wheel, such as those mugs I threw earlier. If you are using particularly soft clay to throw them, then once again, inherently those pots are going to be more difficult to lift away, as compared to if you're using slightly firmer stuff. So in some ways, the condition of your clay can be just as important as what you do with it. And here you can see with this shape, once the bat's been scraped clean, which is something I always do just to keep things a bit tidier, there isn't much room for me to get my hands in underneath and to lift it away nicely. And that's why I make pots like this on bats, so I can just pry the MDF away and lift the pot off on this removable platform. And in some cases, if I feel like a pot will be distorted by sliding a wire underneath it, it isn't something I'll do until the pot is leather hard, usually the following day. The main thing to remember when lifting pots away from the wheel with just your hands is that like anything else when learning to make pots, it's a new skill, such as pulling handles or making lidded forms or assembling teapots. You can't expect it to happen perfectly on the first few tries, and you shouldn't be discouraged if you do ruin a few pots when you attempt to lift them off, as it happens to everyone. But if you are looking for a more dedicated way of practicing how to lift cylinders off the wheel. Just spend a few hours throwing very basic cylinders and then try removing them with just your hands. The aim isn't to end up with a board of successfully thrown pots. Rather, it's the knowledge you gain from lifting the pots away, some successfully and others destroyed. During the early stages of learning to make pots, it's totally fine and normal if not everything leads to finished, fired pots. Think of practicing like this in the same way a musician practices their scales. The last topic I want to discuss is completely unrelated to throwing and picking pots off the wheel, and that's tidying up, which is something I usually just save for the end slate of my video. Usually, I dump all of my tools and my sponge back into that same bucket I scrape my hands off into. I don't wash them so they're spotless every day. There's no point in doing that. Instead, I get the worst of the clay off in this bucket, and then I set my tools to dry out beside it. By doing this, I never actually wash my tools in the sink in my studio, and although that does have a clay trap, by doing it this way, I end up recycling all of the clay from my tools that might otherwise go into the clay trap. This might sound excessive, but if I clean my tools like this every single day, I'm saving quite a bit of clay throughout the year. Once everything's been washed and the wheel has been wiped down, I'll leave this bucket overnight so that the clay can settle. Then, the following morning, the excess water on top is poured away and the dregs of clay that reside in this bucket are poured into my main reclaim bucket, which is eventually all recycled back into usable, throwable clay. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in my next instalment of A Beginner's Guide.